Hello, Kathy Crisco here. A friend of mine suggested that I might try reading some of my own short stories. So that's what I'm going to do. And the first one I'm going to read, as per request, is The Possessed RV, a true story that actually happened. And this story uh, first was published in this book, American Blue, Real Stories by Real Cops, edited by Edna Wiki in 2011, I think. Um, but now it's also in this book, The Snow Deer and Other Stories, which is all my own short stories, not a collection of a whole bunch of people's short stories. So without further ado, I'm going to read The Possessed RV. Joshua Tree National Park is nearly a million acres in the Mojave and Colorado deserts. Situated in Southern California, about an hour north of Palm Springs and three hours east of L.A., its proximity to large population centers makes it a haven for weekend warriors, city-bound rock climbers yearning to climb free, and those high on the bell curve of oddness, looking for somewhere the rest of society will leave them alone. By far the greatest numbers of people hang out in the northern section of the park in places like Hidden Valley, Jumbo Rocks, and Indian Cove. But the park also encompasses vast areas of wilderness where humans rarely set foot and a few four-wheel drive roads snake down off the rim dividing the two deserts and pop out suddenly along the southern boundary within view of the San Andreas Fault and the Colorado River Aqueduct. Burdu Canyon is one such road. The Burdu route takes off from the bottom of Geology Tour Road and eventually dumps out of the park east of Desert Hot Springs and northwest of Indio. The first part of the route, along Geology Tour Road, crosses sand washes and a dry lake bed and is negotiable with a high-clearance vehicle. But further on, it enters a narrow, high-sided canyon of black rock marked as four-wheel drive only. As a federal officer and park ranger, I was stationed in the northern district of Joshua Tree in the early 2000s, based out of Indian Cove near 29 Palms. Sometimes, after spending the morning patrolling the most populated parts of the park, I would sit at the top of geology to a road where it intersected the main east-west throughway in a visible location and wait for people to pull over and ask questions, such as whether their rental Hyundai would make it down the tour route. It might make it down there, sure, although it probably wouldn't make it back up, I'd say. Then I would tell them about the rental car that sank in the dry lake bed at the bottom and about the tow truck that sank trying to pull it out and about the patrol truck that they got stuck trying to pull that out. Spring is short in the desert, and on one day edging towards summer, I parked in my usual spot with a little shade from a nearby Joshua tree. The spot was close enough to the main route to be easily visible and give people time to decide to pull off or to dissuade them from speeding for a while. Meanwhile, I worked on probable cause statements from the morning's complement of citations. Pretty soon, a guy in a pickup pulled in and drove up window to window. Hey, did you know there's an RV down in Burdue Canyon? You mean on Geology Tour Road? No, Burdue. Someone in the campground just told me not to go down that way because there's an RV blocking the canyon. I couldn't really see an RV driving down into Burdue Canyon. It was way too narrow and rocky, and obviously a four-wheel drive route only, and marked as such. Probably the guy was confused and the RV was down on geology to a road somewhere. That would be stupid, and the RV would probably be stuck, but it wasn't unimaginable that somebody might attempt it. But after a couple more reports from people who hadn't seen it, but had been told not to go down Purdue by people who had, I figured maybe I'd better check it out and see what was going on. I radioed in where I was going and got a call from my boss, who told me to keep in touch and tell him what I found. Just as I was starting down the steep, sandy hill that starts the tour route, a couple guys on motorcycles came up. They waved me over. Hey, we just came up Burdue Canyon and there's an RV stuck in there. We got around it, but no full-size vehicle is going to be able to. Okay, now I was more interested. What do you mean an RV? A cab over camper on a truck? No, no. A full-sized RV. Must be 30 feet long. 30 feet? How far down is it? Oh, it's way down in there. Don't ask me how it got there. Looks like it must have been dropped in by helicopter or something. Like a cork in a bottle. Can't figure out how anyone could have drove it there. Is there anyone around it? 
not that we saw, but we talked to some other folks who were turning around to go back the way they came. They said they saw some guy with messed up hair running down the canyon at full speed. How long ago was that? Now it was beginning to get worried. It was edging up into the 90s, no time for someone on foot to be running through the desert. Dunno, it was before we came up, we didn't see him. But I'll tell you one thing, that RV was full of stuff. Chock full. You can see it through the windows. With a wave, the two motorcyclists took off, leaving me to continue down the, to the dry lake bed below. There, the tour route crossed the lake bed, bent west, and came back around on itself. Past that, the route got very rocky, bad enough that it routinely popped the tires of our patrol trucks. At the southeastern edge of the lake bed, where the tour route turned back west, was the intersection with the Burdu Canyon route. The route climbed over a shallow ridge before beginning its descent into the canyon itself. Some 45 minutes into my drive, I came to the first real obstacle in the canyon, a right turn with a bulge of rock sticking out of the right-hand wall. It was narrow enough, and my expedition was long enough, that I had to work it carefully to avoid scraping up against the rock. But here, I could see that I wasn't the only one who had a problem. The black rock was scraped and stained with white paint, and just around the bend was a 10-foot-long, 3-foot-wide, rolled-up piece of what looked like the aluminum siding of an RV. Despite that, the RV had apparently kept going. As I continued down, I began to find more stuff. Chunks of ruined aluminum siding, slats that appeared to be the support structures from the RV walls, and finally, a collection of buckets and tubing. I got out to examine these. The odor told me there was some kind of petroleum product in one of the buckets. The tubing consisted of a roll of clear plastic and a shorter roll of copper pipe. Now I felt the adrenaline beginning to flow a little more. Was this a rolling meth lab? Such things weren't uncommon in the park. Only ten days before, I'd crawled into an old mine aid it and found the remains of a lab in there. And it would fit with the story of a disheveled person fleeing down the canyon on foot. Radio communications were shoddy in the canyon, but I managed to get out to my boss, Pat, and tell him what I found. He told me he was already heading down the canyon behind me. As I went on, I began to see a trail of wet sand and pieces of black stuff that looked suspiciously like tire rubber. Was this guy running on a flat? But there was a lot of rubber. It must be more than just one flat. And more junk. All sorts of junk scattered along the sides and piled on the boulders. More paint on the rocks. More siding plastered to rock outcroppings. Pillows and bedding, stuffed animals, more tubing, unidentifiable debris. Further and amazingly further down the canyon, down where no RV had gone before, I traveled, crawling over rocks, fishtailing in the sand, working my way through slots. And then I came around a sharp corner, and there it was. Thirty feet long, missing most of its siding, missing all four tires, rims sunk in the sand, fumes wavering in the reflected heat from the steep black walls on either side. I stopped short and took a quick look around, including up the canyon walls. I couldn't see anyone. I got out on foot and carefully approached the thing at an angle from the rear driver's side. The motorcyclists weren't kidding. There was stuff piled up blocking all the windows. There was a strong odor of gasoline and propane. It looked like both tanks were punctured. I couldn't get a look in either rearview mirror to try and catch a glimpse of someone inside, as both mirrors had been torn off. There was a license plate in the back window, expired of course, although it came back clear. I decided to wait for my boss before trying to make contact or entry. I climbed up the side of the canyon to a small, flat ledge where I could observe the RV for any signs of anyone inside. But I saw no movement, no indication of any kind that someone was in it as I sat in a thin strip of shade thrown by the eastern cliff. My boss showed up 20 minutes later. There was no answer to our knocks and yells, and the door was standing ajar. Gingerly, I stepped up into the door well. The RV shifted slightly under my weight. Someone could be hiding anywhere in the mess within, and it stank. I saw what appeared to be a peanut butter and jelly sandwich squashed flat under the gas pedal, but there was no sign of a living person within. A few beetles scurried away. 
The beds, table, seat, sink, and central walkway were piled to the ceiling with junk and rotting food. There was no way we were going to plow through all that stuff in the 90-degree heat to try to figure out what was going on. At least it didn't appear to be a meth lab. The buckets of petroleum product were probably gasoline from the punctured tank, and who knows what the tubing was intended for. We retreated and discussed what to do. Obviously, it couldn't stay there. It was blocking the canyon. It needed to be removed to a safer and preferably cooler location before we could do any kind of inventory. But how were we to get it out? It had no tires, for one thing, and no gas. It was big and unwieldy and top-heavy. No regular tow truck was going to do the trick. We discussed whether we were going to have to helicopter the thing out or chop it up into smaller pieces somehow. But a few phone calls from dispatch solved our problem. Brothers Tow out of Indio would come up and get it with their four-wheel drive tow rig and keep it for us in their impound. The brothers showed up an hour or so later. The truck didn't look big enough to do the job. The brothers, on the other hand, were quite large. They really appeared to be brothers in the fraternal rather than in the 1960s sense. After they got their truck situated, an animated conversation ensued between them, out of our earshot. Then one of them approached the RV with a cable and hook in hand. With a deep sigh, he got down on one knee, then manipulated himself onto his back in front of the front bumper of the RV. With a one, and a two, and a three, he rolled sideways, hooked the cable under the RV, and immediately rolled back into a supine position. After a long pause in which we wondered if he was okay, he rolled over and clambered back to his feet. He monitored the cable until it was pulled taut, then climbed into the RV to steer it as the other brother drove the tow truck. Pat and I got back into our trucks and prepared for a spectacle. It was still eight miles to the bottom of the canyon, the nearest place where the brothers could get the RV up onto a flatbed, and those eight miles included some pretty rough spots. The very first obstacle was a loose rock ramp around a sharp left-hand corner about a hundred feet from the RV. Tow truck and then RV heaved into motion, and the RV began leaping and rocking wildly on its blasted shocks, skidding forward on tireless rims. Around the corner it went, then plummeted down the ramp, lurching 45 degrees off vertical, first to one side and then to the other. It's going over, I yelled in my radio at Pat, who was just behind me. No, it's not, I corrected a few seconds later, as the beast amazingly righted itself and continued down the canyon and around the next bend at an ever-increasing speed. Billows of dust and sand rose around it, completely blocking our view of the brothers in front. Rocking and lurching, semi-obscured, running completely on its rims, the RV appeared to be some possessed vehicle from a bad horror movie. As it rocked to the left, the door, loose on its hinges, would bang shut. As it rolled to the right, the door would swing open and some bizarre article would fly out and describe a lazy arc through the air. A complete dressmaking mannequin? A large stuffed teddy bear? A full magician's kit, which blew open to scatter a magic wand, tarot cards, and a top hat onto the desert. Choking on the dust, Pat and I pelted down the canyon behind, faster and faster. Occasionally, the dust would clear and the contents shift enough or the RV would round a corner broad enough and far enough ahead for me to catch a glimpse of the brother, head jousting like a brother's bobblehead doll, clutching the wheel of the RV in a death grip to keep himself from being ejected along with the rest of the flying junk. Finally, the door swung open at the wrong time, caught on a rock, and was itself propelled into the air, flipping 780 degrees, before slamming closed for its final time on the horizontal wall of the desert floor. The brothers stopped briefly to examine the damage, but the loss of the door was minor compared to what had already happened. The final miles of the journey were accomplished by simply skidding the entire RV through the sand like a giant sledge building up an ever higher berm before its front bumper. Amazingly, the RV made it to the bottom in an upright position though somewhat lighter than what it had begun. The brothers casually winched it up on a flatbed and carted it away, leaving us dusty and slightly deflated. The poor guy who owned it wasn't a meth manufacturer after all. 
He was a young kid just coming onto schizophrenia, and his flight down the canyon was from his own unseen demons. I interviewed him briefly a few days later, but there was no point in citing him for anything or demanding payment for the impound. I barely remember what he looked like now, but the vision of that RV, door swinging, belching out bizarre flotsam, undulating through the rising dust of Purdue Canyon, is burned into my memory forever.